speaking, of <laughs> speaking of people I don't like, I hate that we have to do college humor. Oh, geez. Let that sink in. So <laughs> <laughs> college humor just did a whole segment, and it's trending right at the front page of YouTube before anyone had actually been watching it. So <laughs> me thinks there's hmm. something going on there. Hmm. Do you remember when college humor was funny? Comment. I don't. Um, <laughs> about why the suburbs are racist. And they go through, th there's some valid arguments that he makes there. So you know what, let's let's set it up with the argument that college humor makes as to why the suburbs are racist. And of course it transitions into a, a bigger macro argument, but let's go through this point by point because I'm sure someone sent it to you. But the fact that so many suburbs are mostly white is no accident. It's the result of decades of racist federal policy that affect us to this day. In the 1930s, as part of the New Deal, FDR created- that was my Cracking. to help Americans That's what finance that was. their homes. But to decide who got those loans, the government created color-coded maps in which green neighborhoods were good and red neighborhoods were bad. This practice became known as redlining. Because of these policies, if you lived in the green neighborhoods, it was super easy to get a home loan. All right, I can buy property. But for folks in the red areas, no loans were available. Now, I wanted to include that segment. Uh, I wanted to make it a little bit longer because here's the thing. They will take some valid arguments. This is what College Humor does. That's what John Oliver does. They start off with some points where you go, oh, okay, who could disagree with that? Yep. And then use it to connect the dots and draw a line in this instance to today. But I'll give him that argument. Well, I mean, but it, uh, yes, redlining. But is it possible maybe those houses in the other neighborhoods were really good and it was nice low crime areas? Is, I mean, like yeah, but yeah, but then so, it's a chicken or the egg because obviously Black Americans didn't have access to the same wealth creation tools back then. Right, but the they 1930s. didn't draw the lines like every house wasn't equal to begin with anyway. No, it was. Right. It wasn't just exclusively because of right. okay, black white. Yeah, but mm -hmm. you can look at. So the you got to take that back then. There were systemic advantages yes. to white people. Agreed. So I'm saying let's give him as much okay. right. leniency. But that is a valid point, and. Uh, We'll continue here. Next clip. Okay, th this is not fair. I did not get to pick what color I was when I started. Yeah, no one does. And this advantage compounded over time. The families in the green or white neighborhoods were able to purchase homes and accrue wealth. Uh, and this is the crux of the video. <laughs> Here's where the white, you might as well have said, check your privilege. I see. It's where the white privilege argument begins. He tries to say, okay, 1930s policies, we get it into today's white privilege. As though there weren't, hold on a second, hold on a second. 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, early 2000s, as though there weren't any other policies <laughs> between then and now. Beware this, this sleight of hand that occurs. We're, we're going to come back to it. It's going to be pivotal. Next clip. Which meant white families could sell their homes and send their kids to college. They grow up so fast. Passing down their wealth and advantages to future generations. Meanwhile, the red neighborhoods had far less ability to build wealth, and many remained trapped in poverty. This game is rigged. Yeah, it was. So there we go. First up, we're still waiting for the humor part. Yeah, um, <laughs> not funny yet. The game is rigged. And he says, yeah, and they're still in poverty. So this is important here because it, it's not just an omission. And here's what I mean. Adam Conover, whoever's working on this program, obviously he's just a host. He probably doesn't know a whole lot about the talk, topics he's discussing. Um, they would have had to conduct research looking at all of mm -hmm. the decades. Yeah. They would have had to because of what they talk about later in the video. So he talks about people still being in poverty, but he ignores the fact that the African American middle class, their income rose by 40 percentage points from 1940 <laughs> to 1970. Now it got worse since then, it only rose another 10 percentage points. So there's something that 40 to 70, there was unbelievable growth, and then it got worse, and it even slowed down more if you look at the 90s. So th there's a question that should be asked there. Maybe Adam can tell us why. We ended school segregation back in the 60s. Sorry, Ron, but I'm afraid ah. that's not true. Oh, geez. Ron, this is Nicole Hannah-Jones. She's a New York Times investigative reporter who covers civil rights issues, including school and housing segregation. Nothing a red-haired feminist can't fix. <laughs> well, may maybe, uh... Red-haired feminist social justice warrior Nicole Hannah-Jones can from the New York Times answer the question in a truthful, unbiased way. Since property no. values in the white neighborhoods are so much higher, their schools get way more money to spend on things like facilities, teachers, and supplies. Ah, 
Ah, okay. I was wondering how long it would take to get to this. Here we the go. whole white schools get more money argument. Uh, only it's false. It's completely yeah. false. Verifiable. So, so and, and, and I knew this right away because I'd done some videos. Well, not get Jared's done some videos with me on Detroit. Detroit, mm -hmm. not exactly a bastion of the white man, uh, has <laughs> higher than average pupil, uh, per pupil spending. I think of the number here. It's, yeah, the average national average is a little under $12,000. And in Detroit, it's over $13,000. What's funny is a lot of people brought this argument up when we were talking about Baltimore because in the national stage, they were saying, these kids just, it's not their fault that they're burning down CVSs and Walgreens and killing their neighbors. It's not their fault that they're rioting. They don't have access to good schools, though. <laughs> but, and even try, and then people were saying, actually, there's the higher, higher per pupil spending in Baltimore than a national average. And even PolitiFact, I noticed when they were trying to debunk <laughs> this, because I had this in my old show maps, their argument, they, they made our argument, places like Baltimore, Newark, they have the highest per pupil spending, it's not suburban white yeah, kids. Yeah, exactly. You remember when uh, Newark tried to fix the public school systems? Uh, Cory Booker, Chris Christie, and Mark Zuckerberg. Hold on a second. Define fix. Well, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg committed $100 million to this project. You know what happened? Still a problem? Zero. Yeah. Not a lot happened. Okay, but God so, bless Cher. Yeah. She said we should throw more money at Look, all the problems. Tr trillions of dollars, 30, 30 years later, trillions of dollars spent, and we should spend more money for lower test results. That's the math now. Can you name me any other... Uh, any other facet of, of the privatized sector where you would throw a hundred million dollars at a problem with no, no results? <laughs> <of progress? laughs> a lot of pissed of off residents too. That's what. That's, that's crazy. They started eating each other trying to get the money. Like, I, I'm just trying to think of anything. Think of uh, hmm. I don't know. What, think think of a, a local movie theater. Yeah. Think yeah. of a television program. Think of uh, someone who runs a construction company. If you were, can you imagine just zero progress with a hundred million dollars? It's only almost as if they're bad at their jobs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's almost as if it's a black hole of money. Also, they're the only people who should have guns. Next clip. This is a direct result of decades of redlining policies enacted by our own government to build the suburbs. Highways that were built to make access <laughs> to the suburbs easier for white Americans will often run right through black middle class neighborhoods, destroying them. <laughs> now, that almost seem, it almost seems like an asinine argument. It's almost so absurd that almost. the only source she would have to validate her argument is her own her in the New York Times. How, <laughs> how angry do you think she was when Rachel Dolezal came out and she's like, ah, oh, shit. You took my stick already before I can nice. break the ceiling. I was the real life style show, Bob, though. I was, yeah. though. <laughs> you know it's real because you saw the kid doing it with the dominoes. I mean, it is it's real. They are throwing so much money at these specific money. The College humor. Have you noticed the graphics going up every yeah. single the, yeah. the the budget for these things that they're pushing to use? Yeah, it's increasing to push dramatically. Liberal policies. That is neither smart nor funny. Nor funny, <laughs> but the graphics are going well, it, up. It, it's yeah. increasing dramatically. The production budget. Same thing. If you notice, YouTube is promoting these. Uh, also, yeah. not only College Humor but late night programs more heavily, yeah. and they're doing less comedy than ever. I would love this. I would love someone out there to do a study. It'd be hard because comedy is subjective. But even just about jokes per minute, if you could show the amount of money going up the amount of promotion going up from not only ABC, NBC, CBS, and not only places like College Humor, but their support on YouTube and Facebook, and humor going down. down. Jimmy Kimmel's funny bits get less, they get less plays than Jared's farts. That's okay. true. So let's get, let's, sorry, we got off topic here. It which happens. is which is this is this is what this is what Kimmel can't do. He's always crying. He can't get off. He can't I mean, even. He doesn't yeah, have the luxury of getting off topic. Can we get back on topic, please? So talking about redlining policies, um, and. It, it, Democrats have been against, and, and their teachers unions have been against school choice, Bingo. making it impossible for low-income like, students like to forever. attend different schools. The National Education Association has spent $23 million during the last election cycle just to ensure that low-income American kids can't go anywhere else. And this is one, again, <laughs> comment, I've, I've brought people on the show, I've never once heard a valid argument. I know John Oliver went viral for it and YouTube featured it for six days. I've never heard a single <laughs> valid argument against school choice. Again, if you look at John Oliver, they say, well, some of these schools are really, because it's for profit, some of them are corrupt and some of them are bad. Some of them aren't good schools. And so kids in neighborhoods with bad schools, they might have to travel further, but they're going to a crap school now. <laughs> There's no option it's of almost, maybe. Exactly. It's exactly. almost like he doesn't understand free market economics. Yeah. The school's falling apart, but no, I'm not going to send him to a brand new school 15 minutes down the road. No. I know. It's not in my neighborhood. All right, we have to move on with this as though it's something that we need to spend time on. Go ahead. People in the past were the worst. It's not just the past. No, Adam they Conover's the worst. They regularly <laughs> charge black home buyers higher rates on loans than they do white home buyers, even when they have the same credit. First off, you should feel good about it because she mumbles worse than you, not Gage. She That's does. She By the is way, the what worst. she just said, I'm not going to spend it's actually completely illegal to do this. Yeah. When yeah. banks do it, they're fined millions of dollars, okay? Yeah. 
That's it. Case closed. No commentary from Gerald because it's that silly. Go. But without realizing it, you've also gotten a leg up from America's history of racist housing policies. The suburb you live in was built on a foundation of segregation. And we can't close our eyes to that. We included the end card just so you didn't think we... That is how it ends. <laughs> That's how a comedy video ends. <laughs> the only laughing is in mocking of the show. Not right a now. single attempt at a punchline. Mm -mm. Do you think? Nope. He, and yeah. he closes on a white guilt trip. <laughs> how do you think his college papers would have gone without any kind of closure, yeah, no closure exactly. statement at all, no like wrap it up. This is our how we resolve this, how we fix the problems. Nothing. Just. just how do you think his open mic right nights time. would have gone in yeah. comedy if it's like, listen, guys, I know I've been telling jokes, but to get serious for a second, cancer's no laughing matter. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Close curtains. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> Nailed it! <laughs> he invented ghosting in relationships. We can't close our eyes to that. Um, I'd argue we haven't. Okay? If only... <laughs> he talks about this. He talks about redlining. Again, we'll give him that. If only we had an example hmm. of a policy, or maybe a series of decade-long policies, that legislated the exact opposite of redlining. More recently, maybe even, with hard data to measure its results. Could it exist? Is it possible? Yeah, okay, let's get to Fannie Freddie. First off, the Community Reinvestment Act, which started in 1977, was a direct attempt to reverse redlining. Studies show that it ended up contributing to worse lending practice, Oops. okay? And ultimately, it was the start of the subprime mortgage crisis. So then you go to Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. A lot of people throw this term around, they don't really know what it means, okay. This is basically, yeah, this is basically a federally, a series, that's an umbrella term often used, a series of federally enforced housing bills, which, again, the opposite of redline, it forced lenders to provide home loans specifically to people who couldn't pay them back. Yeah. That's what it was, the government came in and said, hey, okay, listen, you are going to give these loans to people who can't pay them back. Okay, um, uh, why would it, well, you're gonna have to do it. Okay, well, you know what, I guess we'll do it now. You know, it'll, be, it'll be like cars, you know, no money down, but a higher interest rate. So if they, they're higher, higher risk, no, higher interest rate, and the government said, uh, no, no. We're gonna keep interest rates low, artificially low. So you're gonna give it to people who have no possible chance at paying it back. And you're not going to rate that. Here's, here's how the market works, right? You know this with, with, with cars. No money down, higher interest rate. Why? Because there's a risk-reward ratio, and they know, yeah. okay, there's a, there's a higher likelihood of you defaulting, of you not being able to finish your payments, and so they're going to charge you a higher interest rate so they make more money quickly. And that wasn't targeting specifically black people. That's no. just all poor people. Well, th th this was, of all course, it was under, politically, uh, under the guise of being politically correct. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah predatory absolutely. lending yeah. and white yeah. guilt. Well, here's the thing. What's so funny about that, the term predatory lending. Okay, let's walk through this, because you can see films like The Big Short. It puts all the, and yeah, the banks had an incentive because of the government, and they were corrupt, and then yeah, the government bailed them out. They were kind of jerks. But, but <laughs> predatory lending, that term, predatory, predators in lending? Th think you, about that for a second. You didn't know like, you could hey, afford that money? do you want to take <laughs> this free money with no intent to pay me back? <laughs> Monster! Monster! <laughs> I mean, would it, why would anyone do it unless they were doing so effectively at gunpoint from the government, and then also they exactly. knew they were going to be bailed out? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there you go. If someone ever says predatory lending in an argument, um, they're too stupid to have this conversation with. Let's so just just do the Socratic method. Well, what is predatory lending? It's when people lend and they're they're predator, they're lending and a predator they're lending to people who can't pay it back. Mm. <laughs> Might I ask why a professional <laughs> lender would lend to someone who could not pay it back? <laughs> you, you're racist. Yeah. <laughs> predatory lending is an oxymoron. What is an oxymoron? Can mor morons be oxes and oxes be morons? I don't know. <laughs> This is an so we have Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. It's a direct example of what Adam and the New York Times writers would want. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. what, are, what are the results of this? Black families are worse off now than in the 70s. Wow. We've thrown more money at it. New York, as an example, 100 million, nothing. Nothing. They're worse. Okay, you want to end poverty? This is something, and Ben Shapiro talks about this as well. Yeah. There are some things that we can do, that people can do, and all it requires, while we're talking about education, is teaching people. Here's what you can do to guarantee, statistically almost guarantee you don't end up poor, okay? Number one, graduate high school, okay? Dropout rates for African Americans are still significantly above the national average. Okay, that means a much lower, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> that means a much lower, I notice when I get mad about you, something Joe and I'm Pesci? trying to keep myself, okay, 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 yeah. okay. <laughs> Channeling Pesci here. So anyways, that, that's the first thing. Number two, get married. Oh. Married is one of the single biggest indicators of, of your ability to build wealth, period. And then don't have your children out of wedlock. Boom. 1965, 24% of black infants were born out of wedlock. By 2015, that number is 70%. Golly. Okay, stay married. 
Number three, particularly if you have kids. According to the U.S. Census, the poverty rate for single parents with children in the United States in 2009 was 37.1%. Wow. The rate for married couples with children was 6.8%, which means that being raised in a married family reduced a child's probability of living in poverty by 82%. Sexist. So we're talking about redlining and the red-haired feminist New York Times citing her own articles as valid research. <laughs> That's it. The single biggest indicator, well, after we have graduate high school, after that is, is, is gen not only your wealth, but generational wealth, period. It's not even close. <laughs> Are you married? Did you get married? And did daddy stay with mommy? The single biggest indicator if you are a child is it, it, it's, it's a bigger factor than your school, even than your parents' income as to whether you graduate high school, whether you go to college, whether you end up in prison, whether you end up committing felonies, whether you end up having marriages of your own and successful families, whether you end up being mentally well-adjusted. It is one of those things that no one wants to talk about, kind of like we talk about the gun stat, but we don't talk about the suicide stat being two-thirds of that stat because liberals want to actually allow us to, of course, induce suicide. They support assisted suicide. They don't want anything about actual suicide. Even in Canada right now, you can commit suicide homicide if somebody has dementia without their consent, it's really messed up. It's the same thing that's happening here. The biggest help they could possibly give is to go, it just, you wanna be a teacher? Teach people how to not be generational assholes. <laughs> Graduate high school, get married, stay married. Finally, the last point before we have to go to Gavin McGinnis, Adam Conover, college humor. Where's the humor? <laughs> Why privilege? Because I said it, though. At any point in this segment, did you even try? I just, I, this is, I can't tune in anymore. I'll talk with that about Gavin. You know, I'll ask Gavin about separating the next, and you can tell me. I'm just, I'm hyperventilating. Take a breath. It's, it's, it's the cocaine. Down there. The of the bean. The left, hey. All right, glad to be back. A nice Chipper song. It for is. Chipper Guest. Chipper Guest, if who's just else, been nothing but happy. We know him happy. as an upper. No, actually, I'm really glad to finally get him back on because he was he was violently ill, mm -hmm. and people thought we were making it up. And then they were going, <laughs> is he okay? And then there were rumors that circulated all the, all the way from AIDS to he was on the run from the law. This is what happens on the internet. Mm -hmm. It is a silly place. You know him, you love him. Dr. Jordan Peterson, thank you for being with us, sir. Thank you very much for the invitation. Oh, well, there's always an I invite uh, extended. So b before we get to anything else, I know your, your book now is up uh, at Amazon, a newer book. It's called 12 Rules for Life, an Antidote to Chaos. Um, I wanted to talk with you about this, though, right now, Dr. Peterson. Obviously, you, you know what's happened in Vegas and the States. And um, we were talking about this on, on a, cu a couple of episodes this week where Jimmy Kimmel was saying no one can ever uh, understand why someone would, would shoot somebody else or commit this act. Now... I know you talked with Jordan, uh, Jordan, Jordan Peterson spoke with Joe Rogan uh, mm -hmm. at length about Hitler and kind of about understanding, um, not justifying his actions at all, but understanding he's not necessarily this sort of monster you want to put off into a box, understanding motivation. But contrasting that with sort of situational ethics and the idea of moral absolutes, what's your stand? Do you believe evil exists and, and that some people yes, aren't yes, able I, to process that and it changes their whole starting off point in dealing with I, problems. I think that if you don't believe that evil exists, that you're either naive or willfully blind. Yeah. To be, I, you can tell, your, tell those who doubt that evil exists to go read about Unit 731. It was a Japanese unit that operated in China, man. Yeah. You read about Unit 731, and then you you have a good discussion about whether or not evil exists. I mean, the, things were so atrocious there that the Nazis were the good guys. Yeah. <laughs> like, ser seriously, man, it's rough. I, and I would warn people against reading about it because it's so terrible that it's enough to burn itself into your memory in a traumatic way forever. Well, so you know, there's a trigger warning for you. Yeah, well, you know what's interesting about that? Because since we're talking about evil, I do believe that today's left... Uh, it doesn't certainly progressives cannot actually acknowledge evil case in point when it comes to actually this was what you're talking about my friend Lee Dorn had a YouTube channel called how the world works this guy is a U of M law grad brilliant guy super high IQ an actual genius and he did a video and it was on YouTube and it was it was called um, 
Japan, what, they weren't the victims in World War II. And he was specifically discussing the encroachment in China and some of the, the acts of barbarism committed on behalf of, of Japan. Now, no profanity, no graphic imagery. YouTube removed this video as hate speech because they thought mm. that it victimized Japanese people. So again, if you understand that evil exists, you wouldn't have a problem with a video out there explaining uh, the historical accounts of this. YouTube saw it just as offensive because it was negative. And, and, and that's where the context matters. If you go, hold on a second, in order to prevent evil moving forward, we need to talk about it. But I, I don't think people who work at YouTube understand that evil exists in that capacity. Well, pe people who don't believe that evil exists, of course, they also don't believe that good exists. So that's a big problem. But they also think that people are purely determined, let's say, by their social circumstances, you know, and so that if someone commits a heinous act of some form, then you can always find a causal reason for that, generally as a consequence of their, let's say, oppressed status or their or their traumatic upbringing or, 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 or such, such things, discounting entirely the fact that many, many people have traumatic upbringings without turning out to commit evil acts and that many people, and that there's many people at the lower rungs of the socioeconomic ladder say that aren't perverted ethically by their relative deprivation. So it's an extraordinarily weak argument. And right. I've tried to define evil, you know, and, and I think the best definition is evil is the commission of harm for the sake of the harm. Yeah. It's like an aesthetic act. And I think the Las Vegas killing really falls into that category. Yeah, I so, do. I, I think it falls into that category, certainly based on what we know now. Um, and by the way, just let's say someone is mentally ill. That also doesn't preclude it from being an act of evil. You, you that's know. true. And, and the idea that the idea that these things are associated with mental illness is actually a very weak argument, first mm -hmm. of all, because the vast majority of mentally ill people are not violent. And usually when they are, it's the consequence of some like a delusion. Yeah. So so they don't actually know what they're doing. And there's absolutely no evidence that this shooter didn't know what he was doing. Yeah. You know, there's every bit of evidence that he did. And like the Columbine shooters were obviously not mentally ill by any standard class standard definition. And it also casts a dim light on the moral status of mentally ill people. Right. You know, like drunk people are a lot more dangerous than mentally ill people. Yeah. Statistically speaking, by, by a huge margin. And so, you know, you can define the an act like that which occurred in Las Vegas as mentally ill, but that's the only way you can make a causal argument if you actually define it that way. Right. No, that guy had a deep like these mass shooters, they, they, I think the story of Cain and Abel is the best d description of the, of the psychology behind these sorts of mass shootings, that people develop an intense resentment for being. And, and there are reasons for that, you know, because mm -hmm. be, human experience is rife with tragedy and, and catastrophe, and everybody has a hard time of it at some point. And of course, everyone gets sick and everyone dies and has the people they love die. And life is very, very hard. And it's very easy to become embittered by that. And from bitterness to revenge is a short step. And from revenge to homicide or genocide is is another s couple of steps that people can easily take. Well, I think and genocide is just uh, genocide is just homicide with more accessibility to tools. Really, if you think about it, it's it's at that point you've already crossed over. I know. Hold on a second. Not yeah, you had a question for it you. It seems it seems I'm thinking out loud a little bit here, but it would seem the liberals have a okay. They, they have a grasp on identifying the outcome of evil as evil, but it's the act itself they have a hard time getting a hold of. So you know they they would say that you know, the denial of health care to poor people that is evil. They right. say it's the outcome of things, but they have a hard time grasping that the act itself can be evil, that people can be evil. It's I think all it's the personal responsibility of evil. They yeah. believe it's situational. Would you think that's a... a yeah, a... I think that's... I think I think the farther you are to the left, the more likely that is to, to characterize the way that you're thinking. Yeah. And but... I think that goes along with a general downplaying of individual human responsibility, which I think is one of the things that's very dangerous about the radical left. Yeah, I think I think you're right. And you know, it's an important point that you bring up about mental illness. You know, I have uh, someone uh, very close to me who uh, suffers from bipolar disorder. And do you know what that people think bipolar disorder is, uh, you know, you're running around like Daffy Duck. Do you know what that means is he is very manic and he gets very sad. He's very hard on himself and he shuts down. He'll lock himself in a room and he won't want to talk to people. Um, this was actually it was 
triggered by a very traumatic event where he, a, a young man uh, died in his arms. So uh, he is not someone who would ever be dangerous. And this is not someone who should forego his basic human right to self-preservation because someone else throws all acts of evil under this umbrella term of mental illness. And then there are so many varying degrees of mental illness. It's, it's a really important point that I think that you bring up. You can speak to, obviously, more professionally than someone like I can, but having experience with it, people, for some reason, they're, they're very anti-generalization until it comes to the widest umbrella term that I can think yeah. of that we use now, mental illness. Is it, if I take a Xanax to sleep, is that mental illness? I think it's, there's the, I think it's liberals trying to get a grip on using policy to weed out evil, and you're never going to be able to find a policy that fully weeds out the, evil, can't. the act of evil, the, the outcome of evil. Yeah. Well, or even the motivation for it to that, to, to, for that, sure. for that, for that, for that, uh, uh, for that matter, um, you know, socioeconomic, uh, security, let's say can only, which I say, which is a reasonable thing to hope for, for everyone. Sure. Although it's generally always comparative. I mean, people in North America generally have it pretty good from a historical perspective, even if they're poor. But the idea that you could use policy to make life sufficiently benevolent so that there would never be any reason for resentment and hatred and and for the degeneration down the path that that can lead you to is is naive beyond belief i mean you know i've known a lot of wealthy people in my life and some of them well far wealthier than anyone with any sense would like to be because it actually turns out to bring with it a tremendous amount of responsibility yeah but they're by no means protected against most of the horror of life you know the people they love still get sick and, and can't be fixed. I mean, it's nice to have access to top-rate medical care, and I'm not downplaying that, obviously. Sure. But they get divorced, and they have terrible trouble with their children, and the money sometimes exacerbates that rather than than um, preventing it. And, you know, the, the literature on lottery winners is pretty clear, is that most of them are less happy a year after they win the lottery than they were before they won it. And, right. And so... There is this deep-rooted idea that Dostoevsky criticized that has to do with the really rampant materialism of the left, that if you just gave people all the material resources they could want or need, that all of a sudden people would be peaceful and loving and kind. And I just don't think that, 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 that there's any evidence for that whatsoever. That's a great point, too. The materialism of the left, the few heads will explode with that. I've always, I've always maintained that position, that the left is the, is, is the party, the, the ideology, certainly, today's regressive left, of covetousness, of pre-transition, uh, uh, pre-redemption yeah. Ebenezer Scrooge. And then if you look at Ebenezer Scrooge, actually, a great, it's like the fifth gospel. He becomes a generous conservative at the end of that tale. You said the word transition. I can't get that I know, term. I know. Yeah, 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 yeah that's right. That Scrooge is a tranny. That's the new Muppet Christmas Carol. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, and it's interesting, too, that you bring this up. I think this is really important because you mentioned they also refuse to acknowledge good. When you try and attribute bad in this or, or evil, but let's use all these terms here, to uh, being entirely circumstantial, right? Well, it was it was poverty. It was this upbringing. You really do short change and y y y you cover up all the good that people have done under horrible circumstances. And you see That's for sure. And you see the left do that proactively with Ben Carson. Single mother in Detroit tried to stab her and she was saved by her belt buckle. He's not black enough? I mean, he was playing triple-A black ball. He wasn't on the B team. This guy had the American black upbringing, and they go, well, uh -huh, second. We, we don't want to talk about that because, look, the schools don't have enough money. That's the issue. It shortchanges the good that people do, regardless of circumstance. Hmm. Well, it also obscures the fact that um, misbehavior tends to dampen down across the generations instead of expanding. So here, here's an example. So if you're a child abuser, there's a much higher chance than average than that you were abused as a child. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to say that child abuse causes child abuse, except most people who were abused as children don't grow up to abuse their children. Exactly. So the causal, the causal track only runs if you look at the actual abusers backwards, not if you look at the entire population of abusers. And you can figure that out pretty quickly because if everyone was who was abused abused their children, then in two or three generations, every single child would be abused because it would spread exponentially. And so actually what happens is that despite or sometimes even because of privation, people become good people. And that's another thing that seems to be completely off the table for the radical left is the idea that 
deprivation and, and hardship can actually make you more compassionate and generous rather than less. And that's very common, in fact, that not always, obviously, and it depends on the degree of privation and sure. all of that. But it isn't necessarily that bad times make for worse people. Right. And that's so, actually, by definition, a bad argument. If you look at the Socratic method, we were talking about this with Stephen Molyneux. It's either a false premise or the failure to show that your conclusion actually correlates to that. reminds me of the story that you talked about this morning about the wrestler or the fighter who didn't want to give a speech after his fight. And it's like, well, think about all the fighters who did. Yeah, he said, well, it was a really emotional time because he, he got his ass kicked, yeah. but he ran out and refused. But I'm going, people fight day in and day out. This is a professional sport, and they always honor their opponent with you know a, a, a concession speech. Um, and, and I do, I, I mean, we could go on and talk about this for days, obviously, but I think it's good that we got into the macro here about, about good and evil. And this is why it's important for people out there, the self-authoring program, because uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson helps you. Well, we're talking about personal responsibility, and we don't try and assist you, the viewer, with... Uh, providing tools where you can actually improve your own circumstance, then we're not helping anybody. So the discount is Crowder 917, the self-authoring program. It is new now and improved, so I'll be redoing it. And uh, Dr. Peterson, uh, where, where can people go find your book? Do you have an audio version? No, uh, not yet. Well, the book is still in pre in, in pre order state, so right. it'll be coming out in January. I think it's January twenty third. Um, it's doing quite well on Amazon, despite that. So I'm pretty happy about that, and I, I hope it lives up to people's apparent expectations. But yeah, it's as good as I could make it with repeated rewrites and some good editing help and all of that. Yeah. And so it basically lists a a sequence of rules, uh, some of which I had posted on Quora under. Uh, things everybody should know, essentially, which became a very popular Quora answer. And um, it's an attempt, my attempt, to provide people with a rationale for living according to a disciplined code, let's say, and, and, and an explanation of why that only not only makes you less anxious because it reduces uncertainty, but why it puts more hope into your life because more hope and purpose because responsibility even though it can be onerous, is also what gives you purpose and, and meaning, and that's yeah. really necessary. So you don't get resentful and hostile <laughs> and dangerous. Well, you unless know. I read it, then that's just how I react to everything, apparently, according to the press. <laughs> well, <laughs> we saw that with your personality report. 3% so. politeness, yeah. Dr. Peterson. Now the whole world knows. But hey, look, look at this, a code of ethics. Apparently, Dr. Peterson needs to read the YouTube comment section because he doesn't understand that only the Sith deal in absolutes that poll on the YouTube comment section. <laughs> Dr. Jordan Peterson, we will have you back soon. Thank you so much for being here, sir. Thanks again for the invitation. I'm looking forward to talking to you again. And I don't want nobody. Want nobody. And I don't want nobody. You got that right. All right, glad to have our next guest. We weren't sure if we were going to have him on tonight because he's, over, he's across the pond. Across the pond. But he actually, here's the thing. We always have bad internet with people across the pond. Except, except for him. Except for you. You, you know him. You can make out every country in that map. This is true. Uh, Bitrate is not lagging. <laughs> on the Twitter at Prison Planet, Paul Joseph Watson, of course, uh, Infowars.com, where you can see his writing and his videos. Thank you for being with us, Paul. It's good to be back, Stephen. It's been a while. It sounds enthusiastic. I'll take it. <laughs> um, so, so, it's good to be back. Professional. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to the professional sound. Yes. Like There's no show this is. Yeah, because professional is a synonym for miserable. Let me ask you. Uh, <laughs> you did this fantastic video. I recommend everyone go watch it on the Vegas shooting. It's gone viral. It has, uh, last I checked, over 1.4 million plays. You know, we have to go undercover uh, in Antifa and actually submit Jared to physical, physical acts violence. of violence to get that kind of play. Um, I'll just sit in front of a map. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even a singing singing map like Dora no. the Explorer. I'm a map, I'm a map, I'm a map. No tricks. No other lyrics. No tricks. None. Everybody's copying the map now, though. It's becoming a bit too much of a meme. I might have to get rid of it. Yeah, like everyone uses that breaking news uh, song that they get an Apple yeah. Loops. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you did this video. You did it really well. You zoned in. I think a lot of people think because, you know, listen, obviously, uh, so sometimes, there are sort of conspiracy theories that float around on YouTube and they've been falsely attributed to, to people. They've been falsely attributed to us, to you. If people go watch this video, it is incredibly even-handed. Mm -hmm. My question is, you're obviously, we can tell that you're uh, not from around these parts by your voice. W where did you learn uh, to be so, so informed, to be so proficient in dealing with the gun issue? Because that's not a UK thing. 
Oh, it's probably through um, years of the argument that, you know, we had the gun ban in the UK. Obviously, we had no any other level of gun crime because we don't have a gun culture at all. Right. But when they did institute the gun ban in the UK, the full handgun ban, which I believe was back in 1996, there was no drop in gun crime. It had no effect whatsoever. I believe that's similar to what happened in Australia. So it's, it was based on that premise, based on the fact that we've still got violent crime through the roof in the UK, which has risen again over the past 12 months. In fact, there was a funny tweet, uh, which I retweeted today, where they had one of these knife hand-ins in my old hometown of Sheffield. And they were like, they were celebrating the fact that all these people had handed in these dangerous bladed weapons. One of them was literally a potato peeler. And like the rest of them were two different kitchen set knives. Favorite weapon of the Hold Irish. On a That's the, not a joke. I've told this story. I was in Canada and at the Burger, you know the story, at the Burger King on Tashro, a kid named Delroy stabbed another kid with a potato peeler. Oh yeah, that's right, that's right. So I, you know, that, that person joke. was doing the Lord's work. That's the point, though. I mean, evil people will find weapons. They have mass yeah. stabbings in China. You know, we yeah. had 80, what, 84, 86 people killed in Nice just over a year ago. We've had numerous similar attacks since. What are you going to do? Ban trucks? It's just not an argument. I mean, there is a thing about the bump fire, which the NRA literally about an hour ago said they're, or indicated they're probably going to cave on. So that, I don't know how you feel about that. It's probably a separate argument, but... I mean, it's the you know what, that's, for, that's oh, for optics. That's I will. So I'll let you continue yeah. with your point, but I'll go back to the NRA in a second. But continue. No, the New York Times coming out with the editorial today. Let's repeal the second. You're not going to repeal the Second Amendment, okay? If you want to prevent carnage and bloodbath, don't repeal a fundamental right that's part of the heritage of America. It's going to create carnage. It's going to create an actual civil war and a bloodbath. If you go door to door and try and take everybody's guns, and that's what they were talking I mean, you saw the Jimmy Kimmel rant. It wasn't just about automatic guns. It wasn't just about bump fire ammo. It was about all guns. He went through every point. It was completely debunked, by the way. But again, it's like yeah. what Bill Clinton said. You know, you get rid of the Second Amendment like you eat an elephant piece by piece. They're not going to stop. No. That's the point. I don't know that that would even qualify as a rant with Jimmy Kimmel. He didn't get through a couple of words edgewise. But <laughs> maybe he, he just has onions in his pocket. Maybe. He almost cried as much as with Cecil the Lion. So I'll give him credit where it's due. What a pussy. So, <laughs> but of course, he's got armed security and he's just increased it over the past two weeks. But well, no, you can't have guns. And I think that's a big, there's a big gap between people who have some level of notoriety. I certainly wouldn't say I'm famous, uh, but, you know, people know who you are. Have people often come up and want to take pictures. Um, I don't have a full-on armed security detail. People who get these network deals and they get a ton, despite no viewership, they have the money and they do have armed security details. So they are, it's, it's like hiring uh, a personal chef. You don't know how to cook. You don't know anything about it. This person may not know a knife from a potato peeler, but because they have a chef do it for them. Whereas if you're at the point that you're cooking yourself, you understand what's required. We need to defend ourselves. Um, and uh, you were talking about the NRA. I will say this. With the bump fire stocks, a lot of people don't know, it's, it's basically something that helps with a technique, a bump fire stock, using the recoil to act like a full automatic. And that's where we were when we heard the gunshots initially. It sounded, that's, it sounded to me when I first heard it, I'm like, that doesn't sound like an automatic weapon. No, definitely it's too not. perfect of a of a um, rattling it's like the, the rhythm was too perfect no it was the opposite it, sounded, it, was, it was oh too imp it was too it was imperfect because an automatic is it's automatic whereas the bump you know you can hear the bump the nra is a lot about optics they cave on issues where they don't have to they don't really often the nra was designed to fight cases that matter all the way up. They don't really take on a lot of state level cases anymore. They take cases that have been fought by little guys and they do at the Supreme Court to raise more money. And I listen, the NRA is important. The Second Amendment is important. But what does bother me about the NRA is situations like this, where people at the NRA know better, but they know, oh, th this is something we have to do in the public eye. And then sometimes they'll actually stomp on other Second Amendment organizations who are actually doing the Lord's work. Sometimes they'll stomp on Second Amendment businesses like they've done with the USCCA and, and mm -hmm. firearm insurance when they're they're supposed to be a nonprofit. So this is one thing, too. It's a, it's a discussion we can have about the Second Amendment nonprofits and causes, but it's not the time for it. This is where the left just thinks, well, you're all NRA people. Actually, there are different factions on the right. We have different points yeah. of view. What would what would someone like your, your view be on this as far as uh, when they say sensible gun control? What, what do you think would be an appropriate middle ground as someone from the UK who's seen the bloodshed over there? Um, it's a completely different culture. The fact is, they're, they're never on their high horse about gun control when we talk about male suicide, because of course now in the aftermath of this, they're blaming all men. 
you know, it's 50 percent of gun deaths in the U.S. are suicide. That's not a national conversation. Right. It hasn't been, despite suicides rising. So, you know, gang violence is what I think one fifth of homicides in the United States is gang violence related. Don't want to talk about that. Black lives matter unless there's black people killing each other, which is a you know primary cause of that. So again, they, it's complete hypocrisy. Going back to what you said about how this has been handled with the aftermath on YouTube, which I really want to get to. Yeah. Literally about an hour ago, YouTube came out and said, we're going to change our algorithm to bury these conspiracy videos, okay, and raise the profile of mainstream news channels and their channels on YouTube. So, of course, once again, who, who are they going to punish? Who's going to get punished through that? Obviously, it's going to be you, Stephen. It's going to be me. Yeah. And it's because all these idiots come out, as you mentioned, immediately after the attack and say, multiple shooters, multiple shooters. We've debunked it one by one. But it goes viral every time. So because of that, they're now going to come after us even more with the censorship. And we can get into that because, Stephen, I don't know if you've got DMs open, but it's been an uphill battle over the past few days with this multiple shooter thing. People will not let it go, despite the fact that it's been debunked. And now that's actually uh, causing The Guardian to write headlines like the victims are horrified by this and YouTubers come out yeah. and said, Right, we're gonna crack down. Well, and that's the problem with the whole kind of alt-right Trump, mm -hmm. Trump era, where people are just like, oh, you know, you just gotta fight back any way you can. I go, hold on a second, hold on a second, hold on a second. Truth still matters, values still matter. If you're okay with the lie, guess what? It ends up hurting us mm. more than helping us. And that's one reason I really like Paul's video about it, because it didn't sensationalize the horror and the no, evil. It just said it pr presented it for exactly theories. what it is. It, evil is evil, and that's that's. It was evil enough without the conspiracy. And you know what else? This is a good, it ties right into the example of, you know, we released this Antifa video where we have, you can hear them talking on camera, giving out knives. Now, someone else ran with a story. Antifa was plotting mass knifings at Utah. Wasn't true. So if you go to PolitiFact, what do they say? This is yeah. debunk, or one, one site, I can't remember, Snopes, but they all r r run together. Some fact-checking site didn't say, didn't debunk anything in the video. They debunked the conspiracy theory that someone attached to the video in order to get clicks. So people out there, listen to Paul, you're not helping us when you do this. YouTube uses dumbasses like you to crack down on people like Paul who's telling the truth. And that you're giving them ammunition. I mean, the conclusion of my video was it looks like it's probably somebody who is not politically or religiously motivated. That's what I'm leaning towards. Right. They've analyzed his computers, his cell phones. They found absolutely nothing because we know now he potentially targeted Lollapalooza and this other festival, which were not, you know, right wing country music festivals. So it looks like it could be that. But people heard like bullets in different places and stuff and that's really accurate when it's picked up by a cell phone mic isn't it yeah. well no now we know <laughs> the guy was firing out the window he was turning round and firing inside the hotel room at the door because the security guard uh, interrupted him so that's why it was a harsh loud sound and then a muffled sound that sounded far away because he was firing inside the hotel room the other thing uh, oh there's a flashing light on the fourth floor there must have been another gunman on the fourth floor no that flashing light was there before it was there during the concert before the shooting yeah. it gets debunked but it, it's, it, there's so much momentum that once you actually address it videos have got like three four million views and they're off to the races and you two right, says, right, him, him at the women's march down. with the pussy hat. Yeah. I'm sure you've seen that. Him at the women's march with the pussy yeah, it's hat. Not him. No, it's, it's not, not him. him. It's yeah. exactly. And people are just like, why are you? Why are you? Why are you afraid? Why are you a cook? Why are such a cook? No, it's, it's like, just not him. No, it's, it's not it's, true. It's, it's, it's that flash of a headline say, hey man, it might have been an echo. Right. Second fire. The, listen, the, the the image they use on the Guardian article that says the Vegas victims are horrified by this is literally the young girl on her phone after Sandy Hook, after this other shooting, after the Las Vegas massacre. Oh look, why is the same girl at every mass shooting event? Clearly a different girl. But that's <laughs> their big proof for how we need to crack down on these dangerous conspiracy theories, and it's all going to blow back on us as it has done in the recent past. Yeah, I know. I remember last time uh, you were on the program and someone uh, someone who I used to be friends with was really upset. Why would you have that conspiracy theory uh, peddler? I said, well, oh, which, which conspiracies? And he named ones that you had nothing to do with. And this is what happens. And unfortunately, yeah. people out there who haven't actually, they, they've just become sort of more so rabble rousing alt writers with this election. They weren't long term conservatives. The, the conspiracies are fun and they like to push them. And sometimes they, they know it's not, and, they, and it generates clicks. The lie is often sexier than the truth. And that's why I really, at last minute, I was like, hey, can you come on? I really think people should go check out your video. It covers it from A to Z pretty extensively, and I think in a pretty in a pretty balanced way. Um, and man, I, I hope uh, YouTube doesn't come after you too hard. It seems like you're doing okay. 
I'm doing all right. I mean, I've been completely demonetized, but I never got any of that money anyway, so I didn't care. It all went to InfoWars. So it <laughs> never affected me. Hey, another affected plug for them, probably. Another but plug I mean, for InfoWars. The, they can't the, complain. The final point on this uh, Las Vegas thing, like, there are some questions that are still unanswered. There was that eyewitness who said she was being told by a woman who was running around at the front of the crowd saying, you're right. going to die tonight. They're chasing another suspect who's apparently a woman. That's a genuine question, right? So the real eyewitnesses said it, reported it. Maybe she just hated um, country you know, music you, a lot. Yeah, I mean, she just hated yeah. country music. <laughs> but the, the hotel room receipt said he had another guest in his hotel room. That's confirmed. Who was his other guest? Yeah. What did his girlfriend know? And of course, the motive, was there a motive at all? These are all genuine questions. Let's concentrate on the real stuff and ignore the crazy stuff that's already been debunked. Yeah, I think you should apply the same amount of critical thought to a meme that's passed around on Facebook that even though it might appeal to your political views, as you do with the mainstream media, because guess what? All of the above are correct and no one is doing their job properly as it relates to Antifa we saw or as it relates to this shooting. I really, please go check it out uh, on YouTube, Prison Planet, on Twitter, Infowars.com. His video on it is awesome. Paul Joseph Watson, thanks for coming in last minute for us, man. I appreciate it. That's all right. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Go get a new map. It's getting wrinkly. We will wrap this up <laughs> after this. <laughs>
it, for example, you couldn't, describing it as the method, this is why I talk about the Socratic method so uh -huh. importantly, let's describe sort of the modern progressive method. You can never fix cancer that way. No. It's like, oh, they're dead. Can we solve death? Can we solve that? Are people dying? Can we solve? Well, why is he dead? It's not important right now. He's dead. Oh, there's another guy dead. Do we have, any, do we have anyone in this death thing? Hundred million dollars to whoever, to if, death. Well, how about a hundred million to, to looking into cancer? I don't want to hear cancer! <laughs> cancer. It is, it is true, they, they're always addressing the symptom, and even more, when they talk about climate change deniers, if you, it is such an obvious mm. statistic with fatherless households, it is such an obvious statistic when you look at people and, and marriage and success, they have to suppress it. Because they're to allergic to self-responsibility, they're allergic to it. It cannot fit in. The modern progressive method requires that you only look at the symptom, don't look at the cause, particularly if it's offensive, and that you suppress information that doesn't fit with that. And that really is a dangerous place to be. And it's, 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 it's the big reason why they're not consistent. We talked about this with abortion. If you Can't think be. I'm wrong, go ahead and let me know. There's no consistent way to argue your position. Viability, uh, whether it's a sentient being, you can't argue that consistently. There always has to be a jagged little line unless you're starting with conception. Unless you're starting with, there's a, there, this person has their own unique DNA. This, this is a living, this is a life outside of the mother. Guess what, the goal of viability. Okay, what if someone lives in New York? And the baby would be viable because of technology outside of West Virginia. Well, I don't know. what? Oh, you're a sentient being. Well, what does that mean? It means you have the ability for self-awareness. Okay. What if you're in a coma? What if I'm asleep? Mm. What if? I, what if I'm one of those people who is so mentally disabled that I, I'm not necessarily. I don't have the ability for self-awareness. And in which case they might support selective abortions, which uh, most leftists do, along with abortion after 20 weeks, and in Colorado, abortion after 26 weeks. There's no consistent way to argue the point. And again, the big reason is because you're dealing with the symptom of it, which is they see the baby as a symptom. Yeah. You're dealing with it, well, what about rep reproductive choice? Hold on a second, this is a great example. Reproductive choice. Anyone out there who's pro I know a lot of libertarian atheists, do you really think that me, not gay Jared, that we're, we're, we're not pro-choice? We're pro four choices when it comes to abortion, okay? You have contraception, abstinence, motherhood, adoption. We're just not pro killing. Fifth choice, four choices we go with you. Fifth choice, no. Again, it's just to stop being dishonest about it. You're only addressing the symptom. If you look at the cause, you can look at the first two, which is abstinence or contraception. You're getting to the root cause of it. Now, how do you help people with abstinence and contraception? It's not by throwing rubbers at them in the high school punch bowl. It's by actually teaching them about sexual responsibility. And what happens with that? Then you have more people who actually wait to have children once until they're married. They have children inside, and then it becomes per generationally perpetuated. Could you imagine if in high schools right now, instead of saying kids, hey, you know what, work hard, vote for that person, you won't have to pay for college. What could you imagine if you incentivize them saying, hey, work hard, graduate high school, get married, stay married, and your chances of unemployment, your chances of poverty go down significantly. What if you start enticing kids with truth like that? I've never, heard, I've heard, obviously finish school, Stay in school, but I've never once heard never. at my graduation class, hey, by the way, find a good, what's really pivotal, kids, okay? Here, what's really pivotal, get your diploma, is finding the right person and staying with that person. The and go through the statistics. A man who finds good, what he finds what is good. No one has ever, to ever told me that outside of my father, no. of course. It was, it, was, it was dinner table conversation. They again, can't tell you because, well, that would be moralizing. Oh, and, again, and sucking like a the baby out of two statistics. because of choice is not, yeah, these are statistics. And it is what leads to the inconsistency of the left. If you take nothing else from this show, take how, take the, this, how to think. I don't care, I don't care necessarily what you think. I want to know that you understand how to think. The left is incapable of this today. Why are you going left versus right? Okay, listen, if any of you believe in this whole left-right paradigm, man, is to keep you in the dark. No, no, no one's keeping us in the dark when before the bodies are cold, Hillary Clinton is implying uh, Tim Kaine and Hillary Clinton are implying that a silencer is what led to the Las Vegas mass shooting. They politicize everything. So you know what? You do have to determine your worldview and figure out where you line up. If not, you're a pansy. You're not finding common ground. You're lying to yourself and you're lying to the people you find common ground with. And you're not really friends. You're lying to yourself about everything. This is, a, this is why the arguments are so inconsistent. Okay, let's talk right now. We'll talk about uh, uh, money. Let's lead with this. We'll talk about school and money. Okay, when they talk about higher taxes, they talk about basic universal income, which of course is always something that will be lower than the poverty line, because once you establish a basic universal income, the poverty line, and then people, they're poor and they need more. So the government talks about this, inflate, this inflated tax, about taking money from people, and of course it includes the middle class. 
I, Forrest Griffin just challenged me on Twitter or something from a two-year-old tweet or a tweet in 2016 saying, yeah, if you're gonna be, if you're gonna be uh, wrong, be louder. So Forrest Griffin, listen, you can you know, make that walk into the uh, arena, we'd be happy to host you. I know that he said, I'm a Democrat, but I like money. So Socratic method, how is that atypical? Democrats want people to have money, just not you. They want the government to have money. They want Cory Booker to have $100 million in money. They want, they want the, the National Educa uh, Association of, uh, of Education. They want the pu public teachers unions associations. They want them to have tens of millions of dollars. They just don't want you or a business owner to have money. Democrats love money, as Jordan Peterson put it. They're, they're materialism. Okay, guns. Okay, let's think about this, gun control. All right, how do you implement or enforce gun control? There's only one way, by people with guns. Lots of guns. By More people guns. with guns. Well, what do you mean? It is going to occur by force. If you are telling people, as you did a, ma a mandatory buyback, if you are confiscating guns, people say, do this, this is the law. And if you don't obey the law, again, ask why, what happens, what happens down the line, someone with a gun takes you away and puts you into a nine by nine cell, which is guarded by people with guns. Here's the thing, everyone I just talked about, they work for a centralized government. Democrats aren't anti-gun, they want people to have guns. Just not you. They want the government to have guns. And so when you go along this trail and you never actually look at the root cause, you're only trying to patch up these symptoms and you're ignoring the giant cancerous growth beneath the surface. Imagine, there is no worldview. You think I'm an ideologue? You think Ben Shapiro's an ideologue? Guess what? If you have no worldview as the progressive left, they are completely devoid of a moral compass or worldview, you would have a society where you and I don't get to keep our own money, where you and I don't get to protect ourselves, have no right to guns, but the government has all of it. And you know what? That is just an absolute horrible society. It's about as bad as I can imagine. It's about as bad as Europe. We'll see you next week. Hopefully no European guests and they're not watching this. More than 50 people were killed and hundreds injured in the deadliest mass shooting in US history. And the left, which tells us to carry on as normal after every single Islamic terror attack, began screeching that we can't carry on as normal in this case and that new laws must be passed immediately. Gun control now! Enough already! Grow the fuck up! The average person doesn't need a fucking machine gun! Enough already! Enough! Enough! Yeah, the average person doesn't have a machine gun because they're already banned. Before the bodies were even cold, Hillary Clinton seized on the tragedy to push for silencers to be banned, despite the fact that a fully auto machine gun used by the killer literally melt silencers. This had nothing whatsoever to do with silencers. Put politics aside, tweeted Hillary, while she literally made it all about politics in the very same sentence. Listen, unless you've got a method of just spiriting away all the gun parts and all the guns in America in one single wish, more gun laws aren't gonna stop this. Unless the fully auto was purchased before 1986, highly unlikely, it was illegal anyway. Criminals and terrorists will find ways weapons, whatever the law is, because they don't abide by the law. The ISIS terrorists who carried out the Paris massacre were able to obtain semi-automatic weapons despite stringent gun control laws. Terrorists are stabbing people in France on an almost weekly basis. Do we ban knives? Last time I checked, mass murder was already illegal. Was this an Islamic terror attack carried out by a Muslim convert? Senior US officials say no, but ISIS itself says its own soldier carried out the massacre. But ISIS claims responsibility for everything. Now, that's not strictly true. As the Associated Press reports, ISIS is not known to have claimed any attacks to which it was not at least loosely linked. For example, the Edmonton attack yesterday when a Somali migrant struck police and pedestrians with a vehicle. ISIS didn't claim responsibility for that, despite the fact that the terrorists supported ISIS and had an ISIS flag in the vehicle. Others say ISIS is getting desperate and only claiming responsibility for the attack to compensate for huge losses on the battlefield. The shooter's family said they didn't talk to him much recently, but that he wasn't political or religious. But then again, ISIS did warn that the Las Vegas Strip was a target. And surely this can't be someone who just went postal on a whim. This was a well-planned out, long-distance attack that used an arsenal of weaponry and ammo. And who was the woman, described as Hispanic, that told concert goers 
they were about to die. So there was a lady who pushed her way forward into the concert venue into the first row, and she started messing with another lady and told us that we are all going to die tonight. Do you know why she was saying that? I mean, was this after uh, the shots were fired or? It was about 45 minutes before the shots were actually fired, but then she was escorted out by security. That doesn't fit with the authorities' claim that it was a lone wolf attack. What we do know is that the shooter, 64-year-old Stephen Paddock, is white. So obviously that must mean all white people are to blame, right? Say the same people who will scream bloody murder when you talk about Islamic terrorism and accuse you of collectively demonizing all Muslims while they collectively demonize an entire race of people. Despite the fact that the event, being a country music show, undoubtedly means that the vast majority of victims are white people. A fact that was celebrated by some on the far left. Including this CBS exec who said she had no sympathy because most of the victims were Republicans. It's the white supremacist patriarchy, stupid! Yeah, because if I was a white supremacist, the first thing I'd target is that well-known non-white venue a country music concert. Gun control debates that don't include disarming an increasingly militarized police force are garbage. Disarm the very people who stopped the massacre. Genius, mate. Genius. Number of Americans killed on battlefields in all wars in history, 1,396,733. Killed by firearms in the US since 1968, 1,516,863. Let that sink in. Number of unarmed civilians killed by governments in the 20th century alone, 262 million. Let that sink in. While Trump asked the country to unite, Vox responded with this. White American men are a bigger domestic terrorist threat than Muslim foreigners. One, these figures don't include 9-11. Two, try importing millions of Muslim migrants and then run the numbers again. Three, most of the victims of this attack are white American men. Can't you at least hold off for 24 hours before exploiting this to advance your vitriolic, hateful, divisive racism? Oh, and by the way, Justin Trudeau responded to yesterday's Islamic terror attack in Edmonton by sharing a call to end white supremacy. Yes, that actually happened. If you care about innocent people getting mowed down by a lunatic and think it should be harder to get guns, call your congressperson today. Yeah, I cared about innocent people getting mowed down by a lunatic in Nice, Berlin, Stockholm, London, and Barcelona, and you all called me a racist. Some people are claiming this is the shooter attending an anti-Trump protest in Reno back in August wearing a pussy hat. It doesn't look like him, so it's almost certainly BS. Maybe when everything shakes out, the true horror behind this massacre will be even more senseless than if the culprit were a left-wing or right-wing radical or an Islamic terrorist. God forbid, the real explanation could be something that doesn't confirm your pre-existing worldview. It could just be a wanton, bloodthirsty, mindless act of evil. And that kind of evil can't be explained away in tweets or remedied by passing laws. It's a permanent existential facet of living on planet Earth, and it will be until the bitter end. I'll leave you with this. Mike McGarry threw himself on top of his children as the shots rang out. They're 20, I'm 53. I lived a good life. Please give generously to the family members of the victims of this horror via the link in the description below. Please click the big red button to subscribe, it really helps me when you do that, and click the bell to allow notifications so you never miss a new video.